I just want to, by way of introduction, introduce you to Gitta Johnson. Gitta will give her story to you shortly, but as a school from parent forums and anecdotal conversations myself, and particularly Mr Miller, have had with many parents, we felt that this is an area that is becoming in, of increasing concern to you, uh, this notion of the boys and how to, how to ensure their safety as adolescents, uh, the do's and don'ts, and certainly some a few more skills for, for you as parents. I know having a 21 and a 17 year old children myself, the, the, the sort of the pitfalls or the scares of, of them at this age. And, and certainly on reflection, I think as a generation, I'll put myself in this very much, but we need to be a little bit smarter about our relationships, I think with our children and, and the boundaries that we set for them. So we, with all of that in mind, we, we went looking for an agency where we could get some assistance. Um, an expert in their field and Git has been working with youths at risk for over 20 years in, in numerous countries around the world, so she certainly fit the bill for us. Gitter and some of her staff ran a workshop for Year 10 last Thursday and certainly the feedback from the boys in Year 10 was very, very positive. There were certainly moments that were supposed to shock the boys um, to get them to reflect and think on different things which we unpacked on, the, on Friday and also on the Thursday and some other different activities that they did to engage them to start dialogue with, with yourselves and with each other around this notion of, I guess, partying safely and, and the do's and don'ts. So without any further ado, I'd uh, like to hand it over to Gitta. Hi, thanks, Matt. Thank you so much for coming out. I know it's, not, it's a horrible night to get out and I know you're all probably all tired and just want to rest and have a glass of wine, a glass of beer. Well, not now. <laughs> um, I've got four kids myself. I've got a 10-year-old, a nearly 13-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 16-year-old, and I can really sympathize with you. I can sympathize what you have to go through and how hard sometimes the journey can be. Um, I've worked in psychiatric hospitals for young people. I've worked in drop-in centers. I've worked with young people who are actually working rock bottom hard, who were living on the streets. Um, and I think that's where my passion grew, where I thought, you know, we really need to do something to minimize harm and sp actually speak in schools um, with young people about to make informed decisions and making the right choices. And that's where my passion now is, you know, running workshops and educate young people and also educate parents. And I'm really grateful that so many of, of you are coming. Um, and that's what our um, workshops with life lessons are all about. Um, for many, you know, when, when you have children, they don't unfortunately come with an instruction manual. Sometimes it would be actually nice to get your instruction manual. Um, so often, you know, we rely on our friends and our family, um, on our own parents to guide us a little bit through this um, wonderful but also challenging journey of having children. Um, for many, many parents, the teenage years can be quite challenging um, and a difficult time. And there's a, a number of key issues that play a significant role. You know, there could be peer pressure, hormones, that could be physio physiological changes, social pressures, um, a development, and also as the desire to test boundaries. And I think you probably have all felt that when you have teenagers, that sometimes they just want to push the limits a little bit harder, as you like. Um, alcohol plays a significant role for a lot of young people. Although I have to say, not all young people engage in drinking. You know, the numbers are actually increasing that a lot of young people choose not to drink. Um, many parents are faced with the dilemma, do I provide alcohol? Even when they're under the age of 18, a lot of parents think, okay, if I give them a glass of beer, then I know what they're drinking. Um, but that, that's a dilemma. And I think at the end of the night, maybe you have a little bit more answers of what you think you should do or not. Um, here's just a little overview what I would like to talk to you about. I want, want to talk about the risks. What are, what, what are the risks involved when young people taking drugs and taking alcohol? Um, current facts, how to prepare and host parties um, safer. Emergency care, what you do when something goes wrong and also um, how you can teach your, your young person to be safer and what to do in emergency situations. With the year 10 students, we did a simple thing of teaching them how to do a recovery position. 
Um, alcohol and the law. What are the laws in regards to providing alcohol to young people? Um, a a five-point plan for parents, just practical ideas what you can do in your home to support your young person. Um, I hope we have time for questions. And I also have one slide, you know, if you need help, what you can do and where you can um, go. But before we go um, in this topic, I would like to play a game with you, a game that I always play in workshops with students. I want everyone to stand up and I want to test your knowledge about drugs and alcohol. If you don't know the answer, don't worry, there will be a lot of other people who don't know the answer either. Okay. Um, I will read you two statements. If you think the statement is right, put your hands on your head. If you think the statement is wrong, put your hands on your bottom. If you answer that question false, you can actually sit down and relax. You can still think about the answers, of course. Okay, first question. Ice is causing the most harm of any drug in Australia. If you think it's true, put your hands on your head. If you think it's false, put your hands on your bottom. Tricky question. And I don't want any peer pressure. <laughs> okay, the answer is, it's actually false. It's not ice. What drug is it? It's alcohol. Because alcohol is much more available. And cheaper, of course. Okay, true or false? Alcohol is a stimulant. Yes, it's right. No, it's false. Okay, the answer is alcohol is a depressant. What alcohol does is slows you down. When you drive and you drink, your reactions are much, much, much slower. So we, I can see we can eliminate a few already. <laughs> okay, next one. True or false? A, secondary students are half as likely to use illicit drugs as they were 10 years ago, or B, secondary students are twice as likely to use illicit drugs as they were 10 years ago. If you think it's question A, put your hand on your head. If you think it's question B, put your hand on your bottom. The answer is it's actually A. We can be really proud, and I think that has a lot to do that we're educating young people. And it's, it's actually a wonderful thing that the numbers are declining. Next question. Each week, one Australian teenager dies from alcohol-related cause. If you think it's right, put your hand on your head. If you think it's wrong, put your hands on your bottom. I know, I tried to trick you. <laughs> um, it's actually false. It's four. The number is much higher. Next question is quite interesting. Ecstasy tablet changes the chemical balance in your body for A, six months, or B, seven years. Okay, the answer is it's seven years. It's a very long time. If young people take one ecstasy tablet, that changes their whole system around. And if they keep taking ecstasy, it could even be longer. What is the average cost of one ecstasy tablet? A, $25 or B, $45? <laughs> Got not many standing? Made up your mind? <laughs> okay, the answer is it's $25. So ecstasy is actually really cheap. If you think if a young person wants to party all night, it's so much cheaper buying one ecstasy tablet than buying four, four beers, much cheaper. Um, talking about ecstasy, I want to give you just a few, a little bit of information. Um, ecstasy is quite popular amongst a lot of young people. Um, it's called MDMA. Um, the effects can last one to six hours. What, what the main negative effects of it is, it changes the thermal regulation of a body. A body overheats, gets much hotter, and that can cause organs to fail. What it also does it is it can cause water intoxication. Um, the body releases hormones. The normal um, 
reaction from your body is it wants to flush out all the toxins and young people want to drink because they want to get rid of the toxins but then the body because the um, hormones are released the the body stores all the fluid and often the, um, the fluid will be stored in the brain and that can cause water intoxication and it can cause um, in some cases death I'm not sure if you heard about this young lady who just recently died probably only 10 days ago it was all in the news that young um, Actually, no, I'm actually now wrong. We're not talking about ecstasy, that young girl. We'll talk about that young girl in, in a little while. Ecstasy, you probably all heard about the Anna Wood story. Anna, Anna Wood was a young girl who consumed one ecstasy tablet at a rave party. Um, her, she was unwell and her friends took her home. Um, they didn't want to call ambulance because they were worried that something that they could get in trouble because they were taking drugs. And the next day she was in a coma and three days later she died. And she died because of water intoxication. What it also does, it releases serotonin. So people feel really high. And, and after a little while, after <laughs> up to six hours, they actually plumb down in a pretty much in a, in a low. Any more questions to that? So we can have the young people who were standing still standing up. Got a few more. Do we have anyone standing? Oh, two. Wow. <laughs> okay. True or false? Adults who supply alcohol to minors could be fined as much as $11,000 and get 12 months imprisonment. True or false? It's true. Spot on. So be aware of that. Even if your young person says to you, oh, come on, it's not that big a deal. Everyone drinks. You know that you have the responsibility. If something goes wrong, it's your responsibility. But we will talk if, um, about parties in a little while. True or false? Alcoholic energy drinks are banned in America. Um, does anyone, everyone knows what alcoholic energy drinks it's, drinks are? It's mixing um, vodka, for example, with um, Red Bull. Um, the answer to this one is yes, they are banned. They're not banned in Australia yet, unfortunately, but there are actually a, a few companies like Foster's who don't produce them anymore, but young people mix them themselves. And this is the, the drink where young people have to be really aware of because we have on one side the depressant in the alcohol, which slows your heart rate down, and on the other side you have the caffeine. The caffeine is the stimulant. So what you are... Um, heart doesn't really know what to do um, and that can cause heart failure and I think that was the reason why this young lady died. She consumed a bottle of um, vodka uh, mixed with um, energy drinks and that's very unfortunate and you hear about that quite often and this is something you can actually warn your young people and that young girl 15 years of age she just googled online w wanted to find a new recipe and there it was fatal dose of um, mix. The problem is with, with these, hang on, next slide. Um, the problem is, you know, it contains, the energy drink contains caffeine and quite in a high dose. And it also contains guarana, it's from South Africa, and it contains twice the coffee amount than, than in coffee beans. And it um, co also contains taurine, an amino acid which affects contractions of heart and um, skeletal, skeletal muscles. And then, yeah, but the problem is too, you know, when, when somebody consumes alcohol, after a little while they get really tired and they stop drinking. But with the al alcoholic energy drinks, because you have the stimulant there, it just keeps you up and it keeps people um, wanting to drink even more. Um, there was a really interesting 60 minute report a couple of years ago about um, alcoholic energy drinks. And often these young people get quite aggressive um, and they're often called um, awake drunks. There's a lot of cases where young people um, consumed these drinks and then unfortunately passed away. The problem is, you know, when you think of a class of beer, it's 285 milliliters. Um, spirits only have 30 milliliters. And if you drink it, pre-mixed drinks, you can drink them much faster. And um, the problem is that the um, alcohol content is much higher. Um, Drinking spirits increase the risk of a range of both short and long-term um, harms, particular when um, particular alcohol poisoning 
can cause. The greater the alcoholic content, the greater the damage to the ado adolescent brain. And spirits are likely to increase the risk of liver damage. The problem too is often they're really sweet drinks and young people can drink them. They don't feel the alcohol content. Um, a few more questions. Do we still have someone standing? Woohoo! <laughs> you know, in my workshops, you would get now a lolly. Unfortunately, I forgot to bring them. Um, maybe we can do this all together. Um, true or false, drink, drink spiking is illegal. Put your hand on your laps, or if you think it's true, put your hands on your head. It is illegal. Um, anyone, any idea of what the fine could be? $11,000 or five years in prison. Um, what is used for drink spiking? Yeah, some people use drugs, um, Rufnol or Ketamine. Ketamine is a horse tranquilizer. So if you think, if this drug can tranquilize a horse, what it does to a young person, they're completely knocked out. They have no idea what they were up to. Um, but most people actually use alcohol. If you spike a drink with alcohol that it's non-alcoholic or has a lower alcohol content, that's classified as drink spiking. True or false, non-drinking appears to be increasingly seen as an option by young people with one out of three deciding not to drink. Do you think it's true or false? Yes, it's true. And I'm actually really, really glad that this is now happening. Um, it just shows there was a study, um, Australian secondary school, um, high school study, and it actually shown um, a significant um, change and increase from young people choosing not to drink from one in 10 in 99 to almost one in three in 2014. And I think the numbers are actually on the rise again, um, that young people choose not to drink alcohol and see it as, as a great option. last questions. Um, true or false, marijuana is not as addictive as um, other illegal drugs. True or false, do you think it's true? It's false, you know. There's a misconception amongst young people when, when they smoke marijuana, smoke a pot, they think, oh yeah, but I can't really get addicted. No, actually they can get addicted. Um, marijuana is the most popular illegal drug used by young people. True or false? It's actually true um, because it's, it's much cheaper than other illegal drugs. Um, a little bit of information, you know, it's a mind altering ingredient THC. It only takes three seconds to react to the brain. Um, it can, the problem we, with it is if there is a, dis, a predisposition of mental illness in, in a family, it can actually set it up. And if somebody already has a mental illness um, and is using it, this can trigger up psychotic episodes. And I actually have a good example. I, I worked in a psychiatric um, hospital with a colleague and he was um, a heavy um, marijuana smoker. And you know, after years of use, he was unable to work because he really suffered from severe mental health problems. And it's such a shame. What risks are associated with alcohol? Let's talk about that. Um, we have got short-term risk, physical injuries. You know, you, you hear every year when there are schoolies that something happened. You know, a couple of years ago, I think in 2013, there was a young girl from Brisbane who fell from a high-rising building from the balcony and, and that due to alcohol. Um, you, you hear that young people jump in the ocean, jump from bridges and underestimate the depth of the water. So you hear these accidents that can happen. And it's important that you, you actually talk to your children about it. There's drowning, road accidents. There's also unprotected sex. Violence, sexual assault, um, suicide and also self-injury. Why do young people take risks? It's actually really interesting. 
it's not like that young people don't think there, is, there are risks involved. They're actually well aware of it, but they downgrade, they, they don't downgrade the risk, but they, they give much more value to the payoff. For them, it counts much more that they're really liked by their peers or to do something to impress their peers. They're aware of the, of the consequences, but they have more the attitude, this can, can probably won't happen to me. Um, it's action, actually an evolutionary feature that young people need to engage in high-risk behavior. Um, and there have been lots of studies done even with animals that, you know, teenage animals um, have to fight and do silly things. So it's something our teenagers are unfortunately born with and we all went through with it. Um, but the problem is that alcohol causes teens to make bad decisions and cause much greater risks. More than 80% of all sexual offences, including rape and indecent assault, and involve either the victim or the offender being, um, being affected by alcohol. And I think you've heard about it. You know, there has been, I think last year, you all heard about the story from the Granbrook, from the Granbrook High School. There were young boys, they were at a party, and um, they raped a young girl. They drink spiked her drink, raped her, and after a few weeks this girl had no idea what had happened to her she looked on Facebook there was a video uploaded with her having engaging sexual behavior with three different boys she had no idea what was happening and this was as, as a result of young people being intoxicated what happened was that these young boys got charged with rape and also um, distribution of child pornography and that was one silly decision that these young boys thought was just funny, putting a video out and, and doing something what they probably never would have done if they would have been sober. Any, any questions to that? No? Uh, and you know, the same thing. If children um, of parents who are addicted to drugs and alcohol are much more likely to be victims of neglect and experience physical and sexual abuse, I think we all know that. If you grow up in a family, this, this is the behavior that you learn. Let's talk about the long-term effects. Um, has got any, anyone any ideas what the long-term effects could be? <laughs> okay, let's go through it. Um, one one um, long-term effect is actually alcohol dependency. You know, people can get addicted. And it's much harder to function, you know. E even when you see adults who are alcoholic, they, they can't function in a normal way. It's really hard to keep um, your job and to keep everything up. Um, Social problems, you know, especially when young people um, consume a lot of alcohol, it can cause learning difficulties, suicidal th thoughts, and violence. Um, mental health problems are also linked with it, depression. Physical health problems, you know, liver problems, brain and nerve damage, and so on. Here we can see um, a few more impacts what alcohol has on, on your body. And you probably can, think, can go through all your body parts, which we probably won't have time to do. Research shows a hangover can be just as damaging to the brain as heavy drinking. The problem too is with, with teenagers, you know, their brain is not fully developed. Has anybody any idea how long, um, at wh what age the female brain is developed? Not quite, but you're not too far off. It's 21 in women, and they say it's 28 in male. So this is a really, really important time. If a young person decides to drink and get hammered every weekend, it really has a big impact on their developing brain. What alcohol does is alcohol can cause the teens to make bad decisions. I want to put on a slight... Hang on, go one forward. This is the the brain of a young person, or an older person, um, and alcohol is toxic to the developing brain. When you see the frontal cortex, which is responsible for, for rational thinking, memory, and personality and behavior, alcohol causes um, the teen to make bad decisions. This part is involved in planning and decision making. Um, alcohol can harm teens' ability to reason and weigh options. 
um, they, they react much more emotionally and spontaneous. They don't weigh up. They, they react out of a gut reaction. Um, alcohol caused teens to take greater risks. The prefrontal cortex um, is important for regulating impulsive behavior. And because it's not matured, um, young people make decisions that they might re regret much easier. And alcohol causes teens to forget and lose memory. Um, if you look at the hippocampus, which is um, responsible for the memory and the learning, if that's damaged, um, your teen will have problems in, in memorizing and in studying. Um, research shows that even small amounts of alcohol can make teens less likely to recall something that they have learned earlier and remember what they did while drinking. So often teenagers can't even remember. And blackouts is something that's very typical for, for young people. Another thing is, when adults um, drink, in, in general, they will stop drinking because they actually get tired. It has like a sedative defect effect. And this is not actually working as much by, by teenagers. They, they're actually able to drink much longer um, without being tired. And that, that is a problem as well. Poor judgment and difficulty thinking through consequences of behavior. They, they can't weigh up the consequences. They just act. Um, increased risk-taking, inappropriate actions, not as inhibited as in, in, in adults. Move back. Um, we know now there's two major issues to consider. Alcohol has different effects on the adolescent brain compared to, um, to an adult brain. The alcohol adversely affects the developing brain of adolescent. And as I said before, in females, it develops at the age of 21. And in adults, in, in, in males in 28, exposure to alcohol during this time could result in permanent brain, um, brain damages. So this shows us how important it is that we try to delay and that you actually go home and really encourage your child not to drink. And you know, when I run workshops, I ask them sometimes, what, what do you want to do in your life? What do you want to achieve? And they come up with these amazing ideas what they all want to do. And I say to them, well, if you choose to binge drink every weekend, do you think you can, you, you can achieve your full potential? And most of the time they're actually realistic and they realize, no, I can't. Um, often I get asked, so, so should I not give my child one class of beer? Um, and I've actually a really clever friend, she's even a primary school principal. And we had this discussion about should I provide my child with alcohol or should, should I not? And her argument was, you know, but at least if I give my son a class of beer or two beers, I know what he's drinking. Do we really know that? Do we really know that this is it, what they're drinking? Yeah, we know what they're drinking when they're with me. But if they go out to the party, I can assure you, even if they promise you, they will still be drinking. You know, you send di different um, messages to your child. If you allow your child to drink in front of you, how can you then not allow your child to go out with his mates and drink? This is, you have to be really, really careful with that. There has been actually research um, done about it. Um, it's actually quite recent, in 2018. It was looking at a six-year period of adolescence, and it actually, um, the, um, it actually says providing alcohol to children is associated with alcohol-related harm. There is no evidence to support the view that parental supply protects from adverse drinking. Um, they found actually the opposite, that it encouraged young people to drink even more. What percentage of 14 to 19 year olds drink alcohol at a risky level? What do you think? Pardon? 80? Let's see. 8%. So the majority is not drinking. So if your child comes to you, your son, and says, yeah, but you know, everyone is drinking at my age. No, actually, you can turn around. No, no, it's not true. It's only 8%. So no, the majority now actually chooses not to drink, which is a great thing. A few facts. Four Australians under 25 died due, due to alcohol-related injuries in an, in an average week. You know, young people need to know about these statistics. 
On average, one in four hospitalizations of people aged 15 to 24 happen because of alcohol. I have a, a few friends who are actually ambos, and you know they, they, they can stress that out. They can see that every day. One in two Australians, 15 to 17, who get drunk will do something they regret. And maybe if you think about when you were teenagers, if you have something to think about, something that you regretted when you were under the influence of alcohol, I think we probably all have little situations. What I find really interesting is that um, current smoking rates have decreased substantially um, among students from 27.3 in 84 to 6.7 in 2014, and I think the number is, is rising. And you know, it's quite funny, I think I've brainwashed my kids now. When they see somebody smoking, they actually say, Mom, why does that person want to die? Why does that person want to smoke when they know they can get cancer? And this is a great attitude when young people have that and actually realize it's actually not cool standing there with a cigarette in your hand. It's not cool. What comes up a little bit more is this... Um, electronic cigars and you know my kids were talking about it and some kids at school where my kids go they had this discussion about how cool it is and it, it's not really a cigarette and it's not really dangerous actually it can be dangerous because we don't know the chemicals that are in it it's quite new and we don't know the side effects of it yet in 2014 65% of students reported ever consuming alcohol at substantial degrees from 82.7 in 2005. So that's actually good. They're heading the right direction. And I think now because so many schools do actually drug and alcohol education, like tonight, which, which is a, a great thing. Let's party. <laughs> no, actually, this is not the party movie. This is... Um, just a recap what can go wrong when kids, when young people are intoxicated. Binge drinking can have consequences. Are you ready for yours? During the year 10 workshop, we actually shown them a film. It's called The Gathering, and it actually shows everything that can go wrong in a party. And I think it's quite good that young people are realistic what could happen. Um, any more questions to this? Let's move on to the topic of parties. Um, let's party. Hosting a party for teenagers is a massive responsibility. I don't know, can you lift your hand if you have hosted parties before? Some were game, some were game, game enough? Um, can you lift your hand if you had not a great experience with a party? <laughs> it's only me. <laughs> um, okay. Um, but at the same time, it's a massive responsibility because you want to make sure that the people attending your party are feeling safe and that the party is not going to end up um, in a big disaster. Things can go wrong, and it's important to also to be aware of the things that are can go wrong um, and to put things in place that, that make a party much safer. Um, there is a great responsibility also in planning um, a party. Um, you know, it's really important to inform neighbours about it. Um, what you can also do is register the party. Has any, anybody heard of that you can register a party with the lo local police? Yeah? Have you done that? Um, d did you find it quite helpful? Yeah. 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 
But, you know, it gives you a little bit of protection. You know, you, in, on this website, you can even register online if it's um, more than three days before the party. Otherwise, you go to the local police station and y you have to tell them how many people attending, whether there's alcohol or not, how old the kids are. And um, they sometimes just send a car just to check it out. And if there are drunk kids on the road, that they will do something about it. It just gives you a little bit more protection. And also when there are gate crashes, you know, they can actually deal with it. Um, before you actually have a party, there's a few stages that you need to consider. First, you have to be um, aware of your responsibilities. You know, whether you provide alcohol, you have to think what kind of party you host. How old is your child turning? If it's an 18-year-old party, it's probably a completely different ball game than a 16-year-old party. Um, you have to decide on the setup. You have to decide on entrance, on doors. Um, so it's really important also that you involve your child in the planning, that you're not the one who organizes it all, um, that your child is there in the planning. Here, as I said, it's really important, register it with police. It just gives you a little bit more protection. Um, talk to your child about invites. And nowadays, we have the big problem of social media. I want to tell you about a story that happened to me last year. We had a German exchange student. If you wonder what my accent is, I'm actually German. <laughs> I don't want anyone to lose a bet, guessing where I'm from. <laughs> um, so we had a German exchange student, and she came from a little town in Germany. And um, there she was telling me, oh, yeah, I'm going to this movie sleep overnight at my such and such house and I said okay no problem just give me the mum's number and I just want to make sure it's all good yeah I did I wasn't given a number there was no number and I said she said to me oh sorry can't give you a number and I said sorry you can't go um, then I found out it was actually turned suddenly into a party which I had the feeling um, I didn't have a good feeling the neighbor our neighbor's son was going there too so I marched over to the neighbors, knocked on his door, was unfortunately bitten by his door, which made me even more cranky at the beginning of that night. Um, asked him about parental supervision, and he confirmed, yep, no problem, there will be adults supervising. Um, and I said, what about alcohol? I mean, she's 15, um, and I'm her legal guardian. Yeah, but you know, um, some kids might be smuggling alcohol, bring alcohol. And I said, well, you know your duty of care and you know your parental responsibility in hosting that party. And he was just looking at me. All my family went to the Swans game that night and I had the gut feeling thinking, I'd rather stay home. I don't have a good feeling with this party. And she was on my case. Her parents even rang me and said, no, 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 it's okay, she can go. And I had not a good feeling. At nine o'clock, off she went to the party in Terry Hills, in a scout hall. At nine o'clock, I received a text matches message stating, I'm back with the neighbors. Party was closed by police. Here we go. Can I stay at the neighbors? We're having fun. I said, no, you're coming back home right now. Um, I, I had the feeling that she was smoking pot. Her eye pupils were quite dilated. She was in this amazing mood telling me how wonderful this neighbor was who took her home. What I found out was that there were three adults hosting a party for over 200 kids. They didn't know that 200 would rock up. This parent left the party as soon as police rocked up. He bolted. He was terrified that he would get in massive big trouble. And that's where I, I just couldn't believe it. Two kids ended up in hospital and cars were trashed on the way. There were two parents supervising. They didn't do bag checks. They had multiple entrances. They advertised the party on social media. Everybody could bring a friend. There was no control. And I, I had this feeling. I just thought, no. Nah. Um, since then, she wasn't allowed to go to parties unless I, I actually <laughs> checked it out completely. But this is reality. This can happen. You know, these are the parties that we sometimes have to deal with. I'm sure you all heard about Liam Knight, the young man in 2013. He was at an 18th party. The parents of the boy who hosted the party did the right thing. They had bouncers there, they had limited numbers, but two girls called friends who were intoxicated. They wanted to crash the party. The bouncers didn't allow them to come. 
They were up on top of the roof, found building material, and one through a metal rod, which pierced Liam's skull right through. Some of my Ember friends actually pick, pick them up. And this is one of my friends said, this is something I will never, ever, ever forget. They had to cut the rod to get that boy in the ambulance. That boy still suffers from epileptic um, fits and is still struggling. I'm, I know, has anybody seen him or, or hear him? He does a lot of motivational speeches. You've seen him? Yeah, he, he is quite an amazing young man. But you know, that decision of these drunk boys climbing up off the roof and throwing that metal spear has ruined their life. That boy is actually in jail. And I bet that these young girls who found that boy to come will also ha um, suffer from these consequences. They will all think about it. Why did we do that? Why did we invite him to come when we knew he might, might have been drunk? So this is party, and that's why it's really important for me that you have host parties safely. And it's so easy to, to get a party out of control. Um, have limited invites. And you know, do it the old fashioned way, hand them out. Don't put it on social media because it easily can get out of control. Um, put also on that the party is registered because the people who really wanna ruin the party, th they get a little bit scared of it because they know, okay, police might drop in and the party is actually registered with police. Um, have adult supervising. And that's one thing I always tell my students when I run these workshops. Um, if your mom and dad want to be there and they, they're adamant that they want to be there during the party, be actually grateful because they show how responsible they are. Um, have bouncers. You know, especially when you know it's, it's, it's going to be big, have sure you, ma make sure you hire bouncers. And also have somebody at the door who actually knows the kids who are coming. Because what's the point that these bouncers wouldn't even know? who is invited or not, um, have one entrance. And I think that's, that's quite um, an important thing nowadays. And I think that was went wrong at this party at the scout hall because they could go in anywhere. You know, do bag checks. That's what I would do. Check the bags. Have the rule, leave the bags outside. Um, some, some young people are very tricky. They are very creative, and I've seen it all. They sometimes put alcohol in a soft drink bottle, or they throw it over the fence and climb over. But you know, you need to try to contain it, and it's your parental um, responsibility. And if your child tells you, I would never, ever, ever do that, would you believe it? You know, unfortunately, the reality is, I don't think there's any teenager who has never lied. And I would love to say that mine never lie, but unfortunately they all do, a little bit. Um, check bags. You know, remove all valuables from, from the house. Hide your alcohol. You know, if you have a bar in the house, that is too attempting. Put your alcohol away. Um, have certain areas locked off. Um, when I was a teenager, I remember we were always at a friend's house and they always had parties in their cellar. And I remember the parents walking through all the time and we never felt this was embarrassing or annoying because they they brought us food this is a great idea you know bring food trays of food and they love you and they don't feel you you're invading their privacy um before have um emergency numbers available have exits put signs up where the toilet is you don't want to have your whole house messed up um as I said, remove um, extra alcohol and also let your neighbors know. Be a good neighbor. Let them know, hey, we've got a party. And you know, everyone has the right to have a party at some stage. During the party, have monitor the noise, um, supervise. You know, I've heard teenagers having a party where the parents are upstairs, teenagers downstairs, the parents just go to bed. Things can go quickly wrong. Just, it's your responsibility. Even if you don't su supply the alcohol, somebody is smuggling it in. It's in your house, in your duty of care, you can still be fined. Um, have times when the party is finished. Switch music off, switch light off. Make sure you know how these kids get home. You know, that was the, the, the downfall at this party in Terry Hills as well. You know, there were two adults there. Teenagers were roaming the street and you know, some were quite far away and you know at, at nine o'clock there on the weekend there's not great public transport 
You know, it's your responsibility. If something happens to these kids on the way home, they can actually charge you as well. <coughs> um, yeah, we said put finish times on the invite. And, you know, I find that really important as a parent. When your child is going to a party, it would be good for me to know what time I can pick them up. Um, what I also do is, when my kids go to parties now, I ring the parents. I want to know. You know, sometimes your child tells you something and it could be a complete different thing. They say, yeah, 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 there's parents there, it's all supervised. And then you ring the parents and they have actually no idea. <coughs> so ring up. Um, group pickups. Make sure you really know how they're getting home. Um, do and especially when you see that somebody might have really drunk alcohol, make sure they're not actually jumping in the car and, and um, leaving. Clean up, of course. Any more questions to the parties? No? <laughs> Emergency care. So it's really important that we know what do we do, you know, because that can be our reality that you actually have, have a, a young person there passed out. Because, you know, even if we have the best intention to make it safe, somebody can still smuggle it in. Um, so somebody passes out, be aware. Um, there's, there's a lot of... Who knows how to put somebody in recovery position? This is something, make yourself familiar with that, and that, that's a really, really good skill to have. And, you know, we, we try to teach the year 10 kids that because they will come across situations where they actually have to deal with someone. If someone is really um, sick and is vomiting, it's not a good idea to put them in the recovery position because you, you want them not to choke on their own vomit. Always stay with the intoxicated person. You know, a friend of mine, when she was a teenager in Germany, she had the scenario that one of her friends was really intoxicated. They put her to bed, thought, oh, yeah, just drink it out. And the next morning, she was actually dead. She choked from her own vomit. If you one day come across your teenager coming home being absolutely drunk and hammered, um, be really aware of that. Don't put them in bed and thinking, oh, just sleep it off. Be mindful with that. And, you know, if you're not sure, I would rather take them to hospital. Oops, what happened? Oh, here we go. This is the recovery position. What is the legal age? I think we all know. It's actually 18. Um, it's illegal to purchase alcohol for under 18s. I mean, it's different. If you decide you want to buy beer for your child, for your own child, that's your responsibility. But as soon as other young people are involved, it's really important um, that you be aware of that. It's an offense to supply um, alcohol to minors. And it's also an offense to serve underage kids in your home. You get also charged when they find out when alcohol is there that you don't provide. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about what we can do as parents. Um, and you know, there's so much we can actually do about it. Um, discuss the issue. Really important is that you have a good conversation with your son. Um, sit together, talk about it, tell them all the statistics. One in four hospitalizations. Talk about what could happen, what can go wrong when people are intoxicated. They really need to know about that. Um, educ hang on, hang on, hang on. Discuss the issues. Talk about the risks. Talk about the facts. Um, talk about unsupervised drinking. Because this is reality. Teenagers will try things out. Um, Talk to them about what they can actually say. If somebody offers you a beer, if somebody offers you um, a shot, what can you say? What, come up with different refusal strategies. And I tell the students in, in my class when I do workshops always, use your mum. That's such a great excuse. Um, your mum is the best excuse. You can always say, oh, sorry, it's my mum's birthday. Oh, sorry, my mum told me I have to watch my younger siblings. Come up with any excuse you want. Come up with an excuse. Oh, sorry, I have a big rugby game. I, I, I really have to be fit tomorrow. There's millions of excuses. And this is something you can actually practice with your child. Um, talk about drink spiking. You know, 
Drink spiking can happen anywhere. It's not like in rave parties. Drink spiking can actually happen at any party your child can go. Um, talk about that. Talk about what you do with your drink if you have to go to the toilet. Um, talk about how you can protect yourself. Um, talk about drink driving. You know, if your child is the responsible one not drinking, and suddenly the de designated driver, you see them drinking, what do you do? You know, what I tell my children, I would rather pick you up at three or four o'clock in the morning than you jumping in a car with someone ha that ha some person that has been drinking. And I think this should be a rule. Make that a rule. You know, let your child ring you when there is a problem. This is another big one. Educate by example. Of course, you know, if you are a heavy drinker and you are a heavy smoker, how can you teach your child not to do that? It's really, really hard. Um, think about your own alcohol use. Um, and you know what I found, you know, it's really hard in Australia and I saw a big difference coming from Germany. It's quite an alcohol culture. And you know, often even when I go with my kids to sport games, there's alcohol there for parents. Or when you go to cheers and tears parties for mums, there's alcohol there. Just be a little bit aware of these things. You know, um, have some, some time where you don't always drink, where your child sees you having a good time without having a bottle in, in, in your hand. Um, never drink and drive. Make that as a rule. And, you know, teenagers watch you. What I've realized, my son has recently started his L's, and I'm sometimes a bit naughty with my phone when I'm sitting at traffic lights, quickly checking, and my 16-year-old is giving me a lecture every time. They're all aware of it. And that's the same with alcohol. Um, don't get drunk in front of your kids. You know, I've seen it. I've, uh, one of my friends, she just gets drunk in front of her kids. And even an eight-year-old, they know that. They realize that. And they pick up on it. Never, never um, glamorize drinking. Don't tell them stories about how dressed you were and what kind of fun you had. You know, you're not setting them the right example. And what I've also found is don't use... Um, stress, uh, don't use it as a stress reducer. Often, how often do we say, come home from work, stressful day, st kids annoying you, you just want a glass of wine. And I, I found myself saying, oh, I just need a glass of wine tonight. And I'm sure everyone can relate to that. But be careful when you say that loud. You can say it to yourself, but be mindful. Because kids pick on it. They see, oh yeah, mum needs a glass of wine because everything was so stressful. That's what they learn. Another interesting um, movie. I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen it. In a minute, love. <laughs> I heard you blokes finish up the other night. That's huge. Uh, Michael, go and get your old man a beer, would you? Michael, are those snakes ready yet? Well, a minute, love. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you blokes finish up after the other night, eh? Hey? <laughs> 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 oh, Kids form the attitude to alcohol long before they ever have a drink themselves. From their most important role model, you. So I, I, I tap myself on the shoulder because, you know, we're all human. We all do things. And just be a little bit more aware of that. Also, when you stand on a football field, my attitude is now, no, this is a, a kid's football game. You know, we don't need to have al alcohol there. If you have a party later on or a gathering at home, fine. But I think kids and sport and alcohol, for me, is a big no. I don't like that. And I don't think we're setting a good example for that. Um, listen and engage. Know your kids' friends. It's really important that you know who, who your kids' friends are, who they are mixing with. Um, and also know your kid's parents, know your kid's parents and have a chat to your child what are good friends, what are not so good friends. If your child always tells you about a friend who always makes them do things they don't want to do, talk about, is this a really good friend? You know, a good friend should never force you to do anything you don't want to do. Um, know your parents, the parents of your friend, your kid's friends. Um, I found that really helpful. You know, if you have the same attitude, you know, if you pull on one strength, if you, if you all agree, yep, let's have parties without alcohol, you are much 
um, stronger um, front. Show interest in your child. Do things together. Um, also discuss, discuss peer pressure because that's a big thing for young people. What can you do to stand up against it? And, you know, tell your child they're much stronger actually to stand up and say, look, I don't think that's cool. Any more questions? Yeah? Do you want, I, I'll give you the microphone. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, um, you know how you were saying uh, about where if we serve alcohol, we can be charged. And then you just were talking about if there's alcohol at the party. Um, well how do we handle that? Because uh, you can have a, they can be sneaking it in. So I'm just wondering, you know, keeping an eye on that might be difficult. And have you got any suggestions how to handle it? Um, that's actually a really good question. Um, and I think. Before we have parties, we can ac should actually think about what do we do, wh how do we react when we see somebody is getting drunk. Um, what I would suggest, if I see somebody being really intoxicated, I would ring the parents and say, please pick that person up, it's too drunk. I can't be responsible for that. You can't supervise that child. You don't know whether they pass out or not. Um, ring parents, that's what I would do. Um, but have a good chat about it because that, that is an important thing. What do you do in emergencies? What do you do when gate crashes are coming? How do you react? Um, how do you react when you find alcohol in somebody's bag? I would tip it out, sorry. Not my problem <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, th that was a good question. Be prepared for emergencies. Be prepared and let your child know what you're going to do. Um, this German lady turned 60 when she was at our house and I said to her, look, if you want, you can have a party. And she was looking at me thinking, do you know what, Gita? I don't think I want a party at your house because I know you would check the bags. <laughs> and I said, yep, I would. And she didn't want to have a party, but that was her choice. <laughs> um, and I would do the same with my kids. I would check bags. And I know my kids are pretty good and wouldn't do it. I can say that with definitely with my two oldest. I can't guarantee you with my 12 year old because he's a complete different child. Um, and you know, even sometimes you think you know your kid, but there could be peer pressure, there could be other reasons why they want to join in. Um, discuss, discuss peer pressure. Do you think peer pressure is just bad? Actually, peer pressure is actually really good at the moment too, you know. For example, my kids, they think smoking is really revolting. And if a whole group of kids think smoking is really, really crappy and stings and gives you cancer, that's actually a good thing. If, you have, if your child is with a group of friends that are really positive um, and think drinking is not the cool thing to do, that's actually great peer pressure. That's um, a great way of encouraging your child. Um, it's just important that you really know your, friend, your kids' friends because that can sometimes a little bit tricky. What do you do when your child asks you to have a sleepover? No? Do we have some other answers? <laughs> do we have some other answers? What are the ground rules? No, he wants to go off to somebody's house. Tells your name. Um, absolutely. You know, I have done outreach on the northern beaches with a big van and you would not think how many 13, 14 year old I found on the weekend at 12 o'clock in the night. And I bet that most of their parents had no idea where they were because they were staying at a mate's house. Mum trusted them because my son never lies. Yeah, well, sometimes they do. Sometimes they do sneak out and come up with excuses because they know if they ask you, can I go to this party, you would say no. Just really important, follow up. You know, same, I followed up on, a, um, on, on the sleepover. If you can't get a number, you should be suspicious. I always have the rule in my house, if you want to stay at somebody's house, I speak to the mum, I want to make sure it's all good. And I think it's actually a nice thing, even when 
my friend's mother rings me, they're 16, she always rings me and says, hey, is it okay that he stays at your house? It's not a bad thing. It's not about controlling. It's about being responsible. Um, we were here at peer pressure. Have a good relationship. Best protection from peer pressure and adolescent alcohol misuse is a strong, loving relationship with parents and resilience building. Um, do you think you should be your child's best mate, best friend? Actually, you're the parent. You are the one who sets boundaries. Teenagers need boundaries. They try to test them, but they need boundaries. If you let them run loose, they run loose. They don't know where to stop. Because remember, their brain is not fully developed. They can't make this judgment. You sometimes have to help them to make that judgment. I like this. I'm, I'm your parent. I will stalk you. I will, I will flip out on you, lecture you, drive you insane. Be your worst nightmare and hunt you down when needed because I love you. So we can be a pain in the butt and I know that. But it's good. Um, another really important thing is um, have clear expectations. Um, develop family rules. You know, in my family the rule is there's no alcohol under 18 and they all know that and that's fine with them. Um, not saying that they never will try. They might. Um, I forgot to mention something. What I've heard from some of my friends, what they do when their kids go to a party, have a secret word. Let them text you when something goes wrong, like watermelon. One word. Have an emergency word. So when you receive the text message with watermelon, you know something is up and my child wants to be picked up straight away. It's actually a good way. Because sometimes... They don't want to tell their friends, I want to go home, I want mommy to pick me up now. That's too embarrassing, come on. But when you get that message, you go on the phone and you say, tell your son, hey, I need you to come home right now, and they can pretend to argue with you. It's much safer and it's much better. Come up with rules like this. Come up with emergency plans. And tell your child, ring me anytime. Build this trusting relationship. And I think that's a really important thing that you have a good relationship with your child, that they know when something happens that they can actually come to you and ask you. Um, involve the young person in the process. Come up with, what do you think? Don't put the rules up over their head. Discuss it with them and explain it, you know, that they understand why. Um, and of course, when you have a 16, 17 year old, they wanna be independent. Set boundaries and limits and what I find is really important, positive reinforcement. Um, you know, if something goes wrong in the night and your friend is out, one of his friends is vomiting and they look after him, actually be proud of your son that they look after their friend who's drunk. Don't come and lecture, lecture them about, oh, how silly were you, you shouldn't have been drinking. They, you want them to come back to you and tell you if something has happened. If you lecture them and if you l lose it, um, they're not kind of... They're not coming to you and they're not going to tell you anything. Be aware of that. Also with punishment. Um, discuss that with your child. Um, negotiate rules, especially with how long can I go out. You know, it depends. You know, if you know the parents, if you know the other child, I think you can, you can loosen your rules. Um, and review rules. Any more questions? Um, I'm not quite sure whether we have enough time. Do you want to do a scenario? I think that's the scenario. Your son has been invited to a party on the weekend. He tells you that there are going to be parents supervising the party all night. You trust him, but your instinct tell you that you should be calling the parents to make sure um, they will be there. What would you do? I think we talked about it. Call. Call, absolutely. And you know what I found now, the trend is with young people, they just take an Uber to a party. Just Uber there, Uber there, Uber back. The problem is, you have no idea where the party is. You don't know, are there really adults there? No Uber in my house. You know, I take them. And even if I'm embarrassed, if I embarrass them, you know, that'll be it, I don't care. You know, I just rather want to make sure they're safe. And you know, at this big party in Terry Hills, there were not many parents picking up their kids, they were Ubering. That's the new generation. 
another scenario. Your child is turning 16 and they ask you if they can have a party. Through talks and negotiation, you decide to let them, but you have both agreed there will be no alcohol. The night arrives, you and your husband are upstairs when your child comes to tell you that someone has passed out downstairs and is really unwell. What would you do? What would you? First thing, triple O ambulance straight away. You know, it's not your child. If something has happened, it's your responsibility. Recovery position, uh, ambulance, and also contact the parent. But the best chance of avoiding this scenario is when you don't provide alcohol. The bigger issue is when you have some kids turning already 18 and your son is younger, then it, it is much harder. Just a few little bits and pieces, you know, be, o be open and honest. Talk about your fears and worries. Um, listen to them. And often, I know it's hard, and we want to lecture them, and I often so many times want to lecture mine. Um, discuss values and beliefs and peer pressure. Go through what-if scenario. Discuss wh what you do if you're somewhere out in Whoop Whoop and you can't get home because your friend who wanted to drive is suddenly intoxicated. Talk about drink spiking. Talk about buddy system. I think that's a really important thing. Talk about your child about when you go out in the night, make sure you're staying with your friend and you look out for each other. Don't leave, leave your friend on, on, on his own. There was a couple of years, a really um, young, talented rugby player from the Sea Eagles, Jason Anir. I'm not sure, have you heard of him? He walked back at Coleroy after a function and unfortunately he slipped and fell down the cliffs because he was intoxicated. I always bring that as an example. Do you think that would have happened if he would have been together with someone? Most likely not, because, you know, the friend could have called ambulance. They could have taken him away from the cliffs. And so many accidents can actually be uh, prevented when, when you're sticking with a friend and you can look out for each other. Give positive feedback. You know, tell your child when they're doing the right decision. Um, when they're, they're making informed decisions, doing the right choices. Often, you know, we're so wrapped up in telling them what's all going wrong that we completely forget about what they're actually doing really well. Give them positive feedback and be proud of them if something goes wrong and they react the right way. Um, if you have teenagers that are a bit older, this is a really great app and I, I recommend anyone to download it on their phone because if something happens, you can connect straight to emergency services, but it also tells you the coordinates where you are. Even if things happen like rape, drink spiking and you wake up in an un unfamiliar area, you actually find out where you are. So it's, it's a good protection for young people to have. It's called Emergency Plus and it doesn't cost anything. Um, what I quite like is um, a parent pledge. We agree to pick, up, pick you up any time, day or night, from anywhere, for any reason, to give you safety and a ride home. We agree not to be critical of any behavior that leads to the call. Just call and we will come. If need be, we will give any of your friends a lift home. We agree to, to discuss any matter arising from our pledge in a calm and rational manner, not getting angry. And we've got the pledge from a teenager. We agree not to drive while affected by alcohol or otherwise intoxicated or while tired or otherwise affected. We agree to call you for assistance regardless of the time, place or reason. We agree not to accept a lift from anyone we sus suspect of being intoxicated. Come up with the backup plans. You know, what do you do? Have extra cash. Tell your child, even if they want a taxi and have no money, Go in the cab, probably not on your own. That's another good recommendation. Go, go with the maid in the cab. Let your mom and dad pay when they're there. Don't tell the cab driver that you have no money. Um, come up with backup plans. Um, that's probably it. This is quite some good websites where you find lots of information. Um, what I found really helpful is the data website. They have loads and loads of information that you can download. If you're interested in particular drugs, in hosting parties, there are lots of flyers that you can download. There are different services. If you feel that your son 
needs a little bit more support. I'm sure school counsellor doing amazing job. What's the name of your school counsellor? Yep, school counsellors are amazing and they probably will have a lot of resources in your local area um, and know what kind of services they can link you to. For kids, I always recommend them Kids Helpline. Sometimes you don't feel like talking to your parents and maybe the first person is anonymous to talk to. That's always good. Um, do we have any more questions? What I do is I will send a link to the whole presentation and if you're home, you can go through it again. Yeah, so everyone can look it up again. Thank you so much for coming and you know that's an, a massive step that you make this effort and it shows your great parents and, and you can be proud of being responsible and being here. Okay, I hope <laughs>